Hello, hello. Welcome to On the Record with LMPD. I'm your co-host, Officer Matt Sanders. I'm joined with the chief of the Louisville Metro Police Department, Chief Erica Shields. Chief, how you doing? Good. Hi, Matt. We, what are you laughing for? <laughs> We're just now getting started. I'm a little worried about this episode. How this one's going to go? <laughs> yes. I'm not worried at all. I think it's going to be great. Okay. We've got a great guest. First two episodes in, got some good feedback. How do you think Ted did? Now that he's not here, let's talk bad about him. Um, yeah, you know, okay. He did really well. No, so, he did very well. But what bothered me about Lieutenant Item is that at the end, he did this like great interview and then he wanted to just change the name to Ted Talks. And I kind of took like, I'm just an officer. He's a lieutenant. So I really can't say anything to him about it, <laughs> but it kind of cut me deep. Did it cut you like it cut me or? <laughs> Probably not as deep. No. Not as, well, I guess this is like my baby or something. I'm taking this too serious. I don't know. Look, let's just jump straight into it. Okay. Mm-hmm. This, this episode um, I don't know where this episode's going to go, but I think the community is really going to like it and they need to hear it. And so do the officers. So we're talking about the guns, the shootings, the violence, and it, it all culminates to homicide. Okay. Um, so you're saying violent crime is your top priority. Okay. A lot of chiefs say that, um, but the data is there. We've had a ton of homicides in the city of Louisville. You've identified it as your top priority leads us into the de- today talk about it yeah so i think you know today to me is we need to improve our performance so that today's guest doesn't keep having to deal with these this record number of homicides so i think there's always that inclination to look at the homicide unit and say well what are you doing about this but the reality of it is as an agency if we're doing our job properly they should be the least worked in the department do we have a guest today what do you think i i yes we do well, bring them on. Okay, come on. <laughs> who do you, who do we got with us today? We have our very talented and charismatic homicide commander, Lieutenant Donnie Burbring. Good See, afternoon, Donnie. That is the worst way to introduce somebody. <laughs> now people are going to assume that I'm going to be charismatic and intelligent. And neither one of those things are, are true, Chief. I'm going to be honest with you. Well, I'm glad you're the commander of the homicide unit then, <laughs> knowing, all, knowing everything we know now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I can talk. Okay. I'm, I'm good at talking. I can do that. That's, let's, that's let's, about it. Well, let's see how it goes. Oh, so Jury's still out. In all seriousness, I really appreciate you being here. I, um, I have to say that this homicide unit has made such an impression on me um, Atlanta had a very, very polished and successful homicide unit, and I was really pleasant, pleasantly surprised to come in and see that just how top notch your unit is and your folks are. And it's really, I want to say thank you, um, because the amount of work that you all are having to navigate is not reasonable. Um, I personally think that you do a fantastic job and I it's not lost on me that there is also um, considerable criticism of recent Uh, most notably I know that you beat yourself up over the clearance rate of the unit and there's also in the media we keep seeing over and over where individuals don't feel that the homicide detectives are communicating with them adequately and I just I want to give you a chance to be able to explain your thoughts on that quite quite honestly so <clears throat> let's start with the clearance rate, because I think that that is the one thing that everybody kind of looks at to determine whether they're a success, maybe not internally in the yeah. department, but outside. In 2000, I, came the, I became the homicide commander in December of 2019. At that time, I had 31 detectives. And we only had 103 homicides. Each detective had about four homicides that they worked that year. And, you know, based on the national averages that the FBI puts out, PERF, BJA, you know, that's what they're saying the average caseload should be for a detective. It's for a year. Four to five a year. Yep. Well, then 2020 happened. And it started out with COVID. And then we had the civil unrest. Well, during that time, our numbers skyrocketed. And my personnel started to diminish. I started to lose people. I ended the year with 22 total detectives and only 17 of them worked fresh homicides. We had 181 homicides last year. Now, that's a total number. It's not just criminal. 
we still have to work the justified homicides. They might not count to our numbers, but we still have to work those. So for the listener, it justified would be basically the individual might shoot a gun um, at someone who is trying to kill them. Yes. All right. Yeah, and we get we get quite a few of those throughout the year. Uh, but those still, I mean, there's still a lot of work that has to be done on those. So last year, I lose people. We gain cases. Each one of my detectives had between eight to ten cases last year. Now we transition over into 2021. As of today, I'm still waiting on the report on the one from yesterday to determine whether or not that's going to be a homicide or a death investigation. But we're at 93 homicides. We didn't hit 93 homicides last year in our record year. We did not hit that until August. That's a substantial amount. And it's very difficult with the amount and, and this is a this is, seems like it's been a a trend on your show where we talked about manpower issues and and how we are we're having a very difficult time right now and just like everybody else like ted said last week and like you and i have talked about in the past it's very difficult when you're catching a homicide case every two weeks so if i pick up a homicide today at the rate we're on right now in two weeks, I have I will be picking up another homicide. In between those two weeks, I still have to go out and help other detectives in my group to work their homicides. It's just a nonstop thing. That is why you're seeing such a low clearance rate. We're at 36% right now. I'm sorry, 33% right now, 36% for 2020. That bothers me tremendously. I mean, that is something that I actually do lose sleep over. When we talk about the contact with the families... We have a victim services unit, and they do a phenomenal job of reaching out to the families and talking to the families. But I ask them not to call the families until 24 to 48 hours after the homicide. The reason being is, think, take the worst news that you've ever gotten. And then if I try to give you legitimate information that is very important, can you retain that? No. 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 So I want people to be able to go through the grieving mm -hmm. process a little bit and then we can come in and give you information that maybe you're going to recall. Yep. So that's why I wait 24 to 48 hours for the victim services unit. We try to make contact with the family members immediately. So to be clear, the, the homicide investigator is going to obviously try to make contact immediately. Victim services, which is a civilian service unit mm -hmm. that is providing support to navigate out of this. We're saying, hey, let's give it a couple of days so hopefully they they, they're grounded enough they can hear me. I think if I'm guessing right, I think that probably the complaints are arising more from a week, two weeks in. And and I get it. It's someone that you love. You you want that to be the top priority for everyone. And But I don't know if, with what you're describing. I don't see how your investigators can, can possibly return f this number of phone calls daily weekly so one of the issues that we have is i try to ask all my detectives to identify one person from the family that is going to be our contact that way we can give them all the information that we have we can tell them what's going on in the case and, and they, they can, can disseminate, disseminate it amongst it. the rest of the family right here's the problem i don't know about your family my family is dysfunctional okay they don't talk so if i identify a person over here there's another family member over here that doesn't like this person. So then I have three to four family members per case wanting information on that. Whereas the original contact person that we have, they don't have an issue with anything because we've kept them up to date. But then you have another family member that doesn't have anything to do with that family member who's the contact person. They're the ones who are calling the news saying they're not calling me back. They're not calling me back. And it's, it's a frustrating thing. I get that you don't want to have conversation with this person over here. But you have to understand, just in two years, half of my detectives at least have 15 homicides that they're working. Considering we got a 36 and a 33% clearance rate, that means a lot of those are open. I can't spend four to five hours a day to call you and say, I don't have anything new. To be calling all of the family members. To call in every the tree. single family yeah. member yeah. that wants to be contacted about it. And 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 I listen, I don't want to sound cold and callous because I understand that you want some type of 
information. You want to know what happened to your loved one. That's completely understandable. But you have to let us try to work the case so we can get you those answers and get you the right answers. Not just say, well, we think this guy did it, so we're going to lock him up. It don't work that way. No, and I appreciate that. I think um, one of the things I know that, that I worry about, and I'm sure you do too, but what is, what's the emotional toll of being exposed to so many violent deaths, having the frustrations of the criticism, having the frustrations of taking pride in your work and having a clearance rate that, you, that you're not content with, how does that impact your health, your mind, and the units? I mean, that has to have an impact on you as, as humans. So you're the chief of police here in Louisville, Kentucky. Obviously, one of the biggest things that you have to deal with are the questions about the violent crime. It affects you. It affects you differently than it affects me. It affects me differently than it affects the detectives. I think there's, if there's one thing that anybody gets from this podcast at all, it's this. I don't care if you're listening to this in Louisville, Kentucky, Mesa, Arizona, Bangor, I don't care where you're listening to this at. If you have a family member who was a victim of a senseless, violent crime, and that case is open, there is a detective out there losing sleep. You can think that they don't care. There is nothing further from the truth. This job, it is not an eight to four, nine to five job. You take this job home with you. You deal with this stress when you're trying to play with your kids or when you're trying to have dinner with your wife. You don't just walk away. You don't put your notebook down and say, I'm done today. I'm going to go, you know, I work at Humana. I, I, I'm done. I shut my computer off. I don't have to worry about it. It doesn't work that way. All of my people, we constantly have conversations every single day going over cases. They talk to each other. What am I missing here? It's a constant battle trying to go from case to case and then come back to cases that they know they have work they need to do. It's a very frustrating thing. They're very tired. My sergeants, they're tired because the accountability portion is very important to me to make sure we do these things the right way. As far as I'm concerned, my, my health and my well-being, it takes a distant back seat to the people that work for me and my family. You know, my family suffers through this just as much as my detectives suffer through this. You know, my kids are like, are you going to be home tonight? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. But it's important for me where I lose sleep have I provided these detectives every opportunity that I can find to help them solve their cases? That's what makes me lose sleep. But in, I'm sure for you, you probably lose sleep because you're trying to figure out a plan to attack this violence. The higher you go, the different your priorities are. You know, and, and, and I think that people need to understand that. I, I'm not so concerned about an individual case. I'm concerned about the totality of the cases. But my detectives, they are absolutely concerned about every single case that is sitting open on their desk. No, I, I fully subscribe to that. And it's one of the reasons I love this profession, because I know that cops take this job to heart. And there's so much more than just the paycheck punching in and out, even though we might present, present it that way. Um, I've, I've always been aware that police really care switching gears because i do i am this actually is i'm curious about this it'll help me okay i get asked a lot um are we noticing any trends and i realize it's it's not entirely fair to you so for you to say that a case is gang related you you have to make a distinct association but i think you also have done this job enough to know i would ask you are you seeing any trends where these homicides are a result of Robbery's gone bad, drugs, gang affiliation. Is there any pattern or prevalent theme that you're seeing with these homicides? So it's <clears throat> most of the, what I get off of the, what I think the, the reasoning behind the homicide is, it's based off of interviews that we've done 
uh, it's based off of family members that have called us with com- with information. Uh, any video that we've recovered, anything like that, I'll just I'll I'll use that as a measuring stick as to what I think it could be. I will say that last year was the first year that I really delved deep into the gangs that we have here in Louisville. Uh, Dale Thompson, your lieutenant in the CID, is is brain man. Mm-hmm. He can remember every single one of them right off the bat. I actually have to study it. All right. So after looking through everything and working with Dale and working with his staff that he has up there in Elementel, I was able to say, rough estimate, probably a third of our homicides from 2020 were gang related. Gang group related. Now, by saying that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was a gang member that shot a gang member. Got it. But it means that there were ties of the victim had to other group members that we know that are verified group members. And social media might have played into it where they've shown things on social media where we're saying, yeah, this guy probably is involved in the life. All right. So that is probably the highest that we have as far as our reasoning for the homicides on when the ones that we're able to identify got it all right so if we're looking at the rest of them though you know and this is just based off of i, I can't say this is 100 no, percent factual okay. but i will say that when you look at uh our homicides i've got about 11 percent that are domestic related all right 18 19 percent over just a fight you know, it might have nothing to do with anything, but it's just a fight. You knew that they were fighting and somebody pulls out a gun and shoots another body. Uh, narcotics is about 7%. And robberies are about 5%. Okay. Now, there's a lot of unknowns in that. Sure. But you can't give an accurate answer on that without having a 100% clearance rate. And you can't, even when you get a clearance on it, that doesn't mean that the guy that you lock up is going to come in and say, hey. Right. It's my turn to tell you what happened. It doesn't work that way. It's not TV. No. So, I, yeah, I'm clearly asking you to speculate. I'm curious. Um, so last week there was this uh, homicide that we had, and it was really disheartening to hear that the person that walked up and shot and killed the person uh, was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. So the suspect is 14 years old. When you encounter that, are you seeing that, whether it's that case or any others where we're seeing the younger folks that this is tied to gang initiation or is it just the accessibility to guns and poor decision making? So I think that, that those do play a role. I I do think that there is something to be said about those things, but I can tell you that based on my time in this city, working in this job and seeing the increase in our juvenile crime, the biggest reason that we have an increase in shooters that are juveniles is the lack of consequences. There are no consequences for these juveniles in this city. They know it. You shut JCYC down. Uh, can you say what JCYC is? JCYC was the youth detention center. Okay. And that's what we had. It was downtown. It's, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't Oz you know, from the TV show. It wasn't a terrible, but it was a place where people were held accountable. And kids knew that if they got locked up, they were going to JCYC. There was a consequence. When you shut that down, the consequence went away. The, the, the way that we have to process juveniles now, it is a painstaking process. It, it is very difficult to navigate through. And the rules that you have on juveniles makes it even that much more difficult. They're juveniles. They deserve more protection. I 100% agree with that. But when you have a 14-year-old that goes out here and shoots a man and kills him, and a week prior, he was locked up in stolen cars with stolen guns, and nothing happened. What is the what are you telling that kid? I mean, you can blame that kid to an extent, but it's not fully. That kid has been he's just doing what he's if there's no consequences. If you would have let me eat cookies all day when I was a kid, I would have. But there was consequences. And that's what I, that's why I didn't do it. These kids 
they're learning through life. You have to give them consequences. Yeah. No, I think that's a, a really, really fair observation. I think it's as the balancing act is, you know, folks will think that police are, you know, hardcore and want everyone locked up. But especially when you're dealing with the the younger ones, I think police more than anyone see the trajectory that these kids are on and know that if there is not some level of, of interference run, they are going to end up in a body bag. And I feel like that we're really in that space in, in many communities. Um, but here it's definitely a problem with the closure of the facility. Well, and, and that's, and that is part of it, but I was never a big neighborhood group person. Right. When I, when I rode the beat out here, I didn't know how much they actually did. Like when you had the boys and girls clubs and all these different groups that are out here, I didn't realize how much of an impact that they actually had on people. When COVID closed those places down and these kids had nowhere else to go, they were sucked into certain things that they probably wouldn't have been yes. had they had the opportunity sure. beforehand. And now they're stuck where they probably didn't want to be at first, but they don't have any other choice. You know, if mom and dad are working all day and you're stuck at home because school's out and you have no club to go to, you're going to go to find social acceptance. That's just that's just human nature. No, COVID, COVID really preyed on those that were already marginalized. Absolutely. Um, Matt, this guest is, huh? I know you're just like, you're like, how am I going to compete with this guy? Hey, I, I made the promise that he was going to be great. And I, I think we're getting a lot of really good information. And Lieutenant, I'm so I'm so glad you're here. I got a couple questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Can you talk like a little bit about, out, okay, so we touched on this in our first podcast about DNA going to the state. Mm -hmm. But now that we have you here, can you, can you talk about some challenges or reasons that there may be a delay in an arrest of a homicide investigation from your detectives? What are some other things about DNA? And add to DNA if you want. All right, so <clears throat> I've, I've been researching this. Kentucky has 120 counties in the state, all right? We're the 37th uh, largest state in terms of area, but we're the fourth largest amount of counties. So the only people that are ahead of us are Texas, Georgia, and Virginia. They're the only ones who have more counties than we do. We have one lab in the state of Kentucky that processes evidence for 120 counties. That's asking too much. It, it really is. I mean, you talk about a group that's overworked. I know my group is overworked. I feel terrible for these people at the lab because they are com consistently overworked. COVID also put a real damper on that and put them further behind the eight ball, not by their, my, not by their choice. Right. But we're trying to rectify that to try to lighten the load with them. You know, we're working on some different things with some private labs to hopefully be able to send some stuff off to them and try to get those results back in a quicker manner so we can make an arrest faster. I've watched all of your all's podcast up to this point. I've read all the comments on the podcast up to this point. There are certain people that I've seen that, that consistently say the same thing. They say, you know who did this. Why haven't you locked them up? Me knowing who did something, that does not constitute probable cause to make an arrest. I can know that you did this, but I don't have the proof. And here's the problem with homicide investigations. In a homicide investigation, somebody has already lost their life. Somebody's life is irreversibly changed. They will never be the same that they are. If I can't give you 100% guarantee that this person is the one who did it, there is potential that I'm going to ruin somebody else's life unnecessarily because I didn't take the time to make sure that what I said was right. By putting a charge on somebody exactly. prematurely or before evidence comes because back or interviews. Because when you do that, if I Google that person, the first thing that's probably going to come up on them this person was charged. This person was charged with a murder. And then even if you say, well, we dismissed the charge. It wasn't. You've still done irreversible damage to that person's character. It's very important to make sure we have it right. All right. You, the tip line. I love the tip line, but I can tell you that its usage has dropped dramatically since last year. Our tip line, 574-LMPD. That's where right. You can remain anonymous. You can, rename, you can remain anonymous. I think everybody thinks that, oh, they're going to track my phone. Guys, we're not. 
I, I just want the information. Yeah, I want the information, right? But having said that, understand this: you providing me with a name of somebody who did it without giving me any type of information as to how they did it or a person who saw them do it, that helps me understand who did it, but that does not help me make an arrest. Because if Chief Shields and Matt Sanders get into a fight. Oh, boy. I'm winning. And (laughs) and a, a couple hours later, Matt ends up dead. Guess not. Yeah, you lost, bro. <laughs> Matt ends up dead. Beth calls and says, Erica Shields is the one that killed him. Okay. So I go lock you up because, by God, she said you did it. What proof do I have that you did it? I have nothing. I just know that there was a fight earlier in the day. That doesn't help. I understand people want to try to come forward. They want. I think people inherently want to do the right thing. I agree. I, I think that the public, I think they want to do the right thing. And I think that we've been, we, we have somewhat created some of our own issues that we've had with public trust where people don't want to come forward. But I have to say this, and this is, this is another thing that's very important. The violence in this city is not a police problem alone. It is a community problem. And until the community is willing to step up with us and help us right this ship, I don't think we can get to where we need to be. That does take doing things that are difficult for you. And I think all of us have to do things that are difficult. So what you're saying, if you're going to use the tip line, be descriptive. Use it. You can remain anonymous. Be as descriptive as possible. Listen, I'll take yep. whatever information that you want to give me, and we will look into it, guaranteed. I have a question, and I think I know this answer, but I want to hear it from you. Mm-hmm. Your unit responds to a homicide scene that's there's a body in the street, mm-hmm. and it's the middle of the summer, middle of the day. Uh, when I rode the beat, I used to keep like a blanket in the trunk of my car. EMS has like sheets and stuff. Why is it so difficult for your unit to not show some respect and just put a sheet over the body out of respect to the family. There's people around social media. You know, we have hecklers on the perimeter. Like how, I don't understand why you guys just can't throw a sheet over it. It's not that hard. Talk about that, please. I understand where you're coming from on that. Here's the problem. The body. Don't take this cold and callous. The body becomes evidence. Okay. Whatever is on the body As the investigator, I have to answer for whatever is on that body. If you take a a blanket that you had in your car that you have used and you put it over the body, if we do DNA on that body, your DNA is going to be on that body. Now, I have to explain that we we had a suspect. It was a good suspect. But you've given a defense attorney a prime opportunity to say, it wasn't my guy. Look, he had other DNA on him. He had other DNA on his body, so it couldn't have been my guy. My guy's DNA wasn't on the body. You're just giving people, you're giving a defense attorney the opportunity to combat the case in a more realistic manner that we don't want. We try to use screens. We try to make sure that we're as respectful as we can be. Usually when I get to talk to the family and I can explain everything to them. They probably understand. That's that's usually the end of it. Usually I got people and they're like, no, I'm good. I understand that. That makes sense. But when officers don't explain it or if I haven't done my job and explained it to them why we shouldn't do that. Right. It causes confrontation between the families and the police department right there. So I try to do that as, as quickly as I possibly can by identifying a family member and speaking to them. That makes sense. Chief, speak to the beat cops for a second, okay? Because we have the homicide commander on here, but you know, I know our, the rank and file listen. What's your message to that beat cop that's holding the perimeter of a homicide scene? And it's the middle of July and the community's fed up with seeing dead bodies and they're getting heckled and, uh, and filmed, which is okay, but they're holding that scene. They're doing their job. What's your message to that, to that beat cop? 
Well, I think that you just, you need to take the high road and you need to know that there's an enormous amount of emotion involved and be tolerant, be patient and secure the scene. I mean, he, Donnie's just spent 30 minutes explaining to us how critical the evidence collection is. And if you allow yourself to become distracted um, and emotionally um, escalated, you're going to, you're going to slip up. I mean, I, how many times I can't think when I was a beat cop that the shooter was lingering on the periphery. Are you securing the periphery? Are you watching who's there? I mean, I think police, regardless of what you're doing this summer, I mean, I think it's in, incumbent that you, that you really have composure about you. Um, Donnie, I just want to say that you and your folks are doing a fantastic job. And I think that just keep hitting at it and know that I have complete faith in you I and your people. I appreciate Chief. Thank you so much. Listen, uh, thank you again, Lieutenant, for coming out. Great information. This is, I definitely want to circle back with you, especially uh, as we work through the homicides in the city of Louisville and violent crime in general. You are more than welcome to come back on this show anytime you want. He um, wants your position, man. He, no, you know I, what? I, I, My I position's in trouble because you did a hell of a job. Man. But I got to be honest with much. you. Uh, last time I ch- isn't this your podcast? Like he's <laughs> yep. inviting people on for your podcast. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, hey, anybody want to come on this show? Let go. Come on, let's have fun. I just it is hers. I just facilitate, and my job's in trouble after you come here today. So really, Dude, thank your you. Job's in much. trouble for inviting me back without asking her. She might fire me. She after wants you done. back. I promise you. We learned a lot today. <laughs> we're gonna wrap it up. I hope everybody you know learned something from the podcast. Um, come back in a week or two. We're gonna have some some crime scene text. We're gonna have recruitment and selection. Um. Thanks a lot for listening to the podcast. You're on the record with LMPD. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.